This is a Rook Media series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 31. Hi there, and welcome to the Contemporary History of Iran, a series from Rook Media. This is Part 31, Rethinking the Shah of Iran, Episode 2. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Our aim with this series is to explore the events, personalities, and issues that have shaped modern Iran. We want to do this as much as possible through a non-traditional lens, through snapshots of change and using alternative voices or angles. This series is mostly in English and will feature a new episode posted every Thursday across our Rook Media platforms. We will post subtitled excerpts with Farsi Zirnavis on our YouTube and Instagram sites. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. And we invite you to check out parts 1 through 30 of this series that are already posted. To become a sponsor or patron of Rook Media, please contact us through our website. All right, let's get started. Here now is The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 31. There is perhaps no greater figure in the contemporary history of Iran than the last Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, who reigned from 1941 until his overthrow in the Iranian Revolution of 1979. He's an imperial figure of adoration, controversy, admiration, and blame. He was the great modernizer who catapulted Iran into global prominence, or a flawed dictator who enabled the ascendance of the current theocratic regime. There are differing opinions on the legacy of Mohammad Reza Shah over 40 years after his death in exile, and so we will be dedicating a number of episodes of this history series to his life and legacy. Recently, on part 29 of the contemporary history of Iran, we began our look at the rethinking of the Shah of Iran with one of the best-known intellectuals in the Iranian diaspora and an acclaimed author of books, articles, and compendiums dealing with Iran and Iranian history, Dr. Abbas Milani. Today, we continue with a very different voice. In fact, my guest today is a non-Iranian who has dared to investigate and publish a book focused on the most debated figure in Iranian affairs. Dr. Andrew Scott Cooper did his PhD in U.S.-Iran studies. He is an historian, analyst, and the author of two books on the history of the modern Middle East. His first, The Oil Kings, How the U.S., Iran, and Saudi Arabia Changed the Balance of Power in the Middle East, provides readers with a comprehensive comprehensive account of America's relations with oil producers, Iran and Saudi Arabia, during the 1970s energy crisis. His second book, The Fall of Heaven, The Pahlavis and the Final Days of Imperial Iran, came out in 2016 and explores the downfall of the Shah of Iran from the perspectives of family members, courtiers, revolutionaries, and diplomats. As we enter this fifth decade since the death of the Shah whilst in exile in Egypt, and given the evolving and shifting impressions and sentiments towards the Pahlavi era across the diaspora and inside Iran, it seems that Professor Cooper is the most relevant voice to hear from today. This interview was recorded for the Rook program, and Dr. Andrew Scott Cooper joined me from Brussels, Belgium. Here's our conversation. Hello, sir. Hello, thank you so much for, for inviting me to to discuss the Shah today. Thank you so much for doing this, Andrew. There is uh, so much to get to when it comes to the Shah. Let me start uh, 
uh, with you. Uh, it would be mm-hmm. absurd to suggest history can only be written by those of a certain background or ethnicity. But it is interesting that a guy named Andrew Scott Cooper from New Zealand did his PhD in Iran U.S. studies and now has a book about the Pahlavi dynasty and, of course, the end of it. Why did you gravitate towards writing about Iran and the Shah? Well, I was uh, I was also a boy in the 1970s, and I was uh, nine years old when the revolution happened. I remember watching the big crowds come out on the streets on TV around uh, December, Christmas time, 1978. And it was also, that was around the time that I began reading history books and I became sort of really obsessed with the whole study of history. I studied history at university. There was no Middle East history uh, in New Zealand. Uh, there were no contemporary studies uh, of that sort. But by the time I was living in the United States in 2005, 2006, I was working uh, in office jobs in New York, I was really unhappy with my career and I decided to test myself to essentially say, well, you know, if you think you can do a better job than the other historians, then you have to, you have to prove it to yourself. Hmm. So I gave myself a year to, uh, to do background research and see if there was some part of the revolutionary narrative that had been overlooked by other scholars and I was uh, fortunate to be the first person to access the archive of General Brent Scowcroft, who was the um, national security advisor to President Ford. And he was Kissinger's deputy under Nixon. And by accessing his papers, I came across these raw transcripts of US-Iran relations, and in particular, the Shah's intimate conversations with presidents Nixon and Ford and the senior advisors, those papers really led me to um, start looking at the oil relationship between the United States and Iran. And in particular, I wondered if turmoil in the oil markets in the late 1970s had in, in any way contributed to instability in Iran and possibly contributing to the collapse of the Pahlavi dynasty. So right. out of that inquiry came my first book, The Oil Kings. It's interesting, I can only imagine, for uh, an audience that we have that perhaps is largely people somehow connected to or of Iranian descent um, to hear a, a, what we'd say a Khadiji guy, like a, a you know a non-Iranian guy, <laughs> even though we're all, I'm Khadiji, I mean, I grew up outside Iran, uh, but, uh, but but somebody of non-Iranian descent um, mm. working in this, in this field and taking this deep dive, as I call it. But you say something interesting in the book that actually makes a lot of sense. You say that for some of your primary source Iranian interviewees, those who were on the front lines while you were researching for this book and when you were doing interviews for this book, that it was actually an asset or somehow an advantage for you to be an outsider, a New Zealand-born historian. How so? I think the biggest asset I had was to be non-Iranian. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that uh, many of the people who um, knew the Shah best and worked with him distrust uh, the Iranian intellectual class and the, the bitter differences, ideological differences that really caused so much, so many problems while the Shah was in power have actually continued all the way through over the past 40 years. So they had also, they, they felt that it wouldn't matter what they said to an Iranian born historian or scholar, their words would somehow be manipulated or phrased in a way that would that would reflect badly on on the period and the Shah. I mean, I I think as an outsider, I was able to do things like um, not only uh, interview the Shabanu and the family members and members of the entourage, but I was able to travel to Iran and uh, I, I did a short term sabbatical uh, in Gom uh, as as a guest of one of the universities there. Actually, a condition of my visa to go to Iran was that I had to go to Gom, <laughs> and I had to do a short-term sabbatical on Shia studies. Interesting. Um, that turned out to be a tremendous uh, asset for me. It really was a fantastic experience. So, on the one hand, I'm working with the family and interviewing the family members and their closest intimates, and then on the other hand, I can go to Iran and I can be in Gom where, where the revolution started, and I my teachers were... 
religious people. They were turbans. And then I was able to go to uh, Paris and interview Mr. Bani Saad, who is a friend of no one, really. <laughs> um, I spent an interesting afternoon with him. And then the fourth part of the, of the square is, is I, was, I was able to talk to the Americans. They also opened up to me. So it's, it's been an outsider. It's been a non, not being a non-Iranian, but it's also been someone who knows how to listen and someone who I think has some diplomatic skills, which I've had for most of my most of my career. I think I worked at the United Nations uh, when I was very young, and then at Human Rights Watch. So I I was trained as a researcher very early on. So everything for me, the, the whole story of the two books for me has also been a personal journey into the heart of contemporary Iranian history. Well, I can only imagine that now that you've put this book out, you're aware that pretty much everything you say will be judged one way or another by, by, <laughs> by people who are, are, are listening and, and have opinions about the show. And I, and I guess I, I should, as we start to get into the details of your book, I mean, it's, it seems like an odd question to ask a historian because I, I suspect I, would, I know the answer that you'll give, but how objective are you would be the question. On the cover of, the, of, of this book, The Fall of Heaven, at least the, the edition I have, there's a, a positive blurb from the Washington Post. It's a review of your book, but it also says a sympathetic nuanced portrait sympathetic and uh, to be sure now it is impossible to discuss any major leader of the 20th century let alone one that was toppled in a popular revolution without expecting the character to be polarizing um, so you would know going into this that any portrait of the Shah is going to have naysayers on one side or the other. But do you agree with the sympathetic assessment? And if so, did you enter into writing this book with a particular idea about the Shah? The understanding I had, the background I had, was really from Oil Kings, the, my, my first book, which had really changed the way I thought about the Shah. The Shah comes across in these American documents from the 1970s that were obviously classified for, for 30 years. He comes across as a, a, a as a nationalist, as someone who's very distrustful of the Americans, but that was mainly focused on foreign defense and petroleum policy. Looking at the Shah internally, um, all I had to work with were was a body of literature that had portrayed the Shah as this frankly, as, a, as either a coward or as a, a monster. So you can imagine trying to square the circle between a coward and a monster, that these narratives have been baked in since the early 1980s, actually since the late 1970s, I think. So I, I went and I did actually go in with a, with a, 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 a really a, a blank slate. And I remember one of the Shah's uh, people who knew him very well told me a story that I found confounding in, in it, it about how gentle he was as an individual, that this was a very shy man. He was uh, someone who absolutely abhorred bloodshed. And so I heard that and I was listening to people telling me these stories about how he was so shy that actually he couldn't look you in the eyes. And then I was trying to square that with the human rights situation in Iran and when I, I learned that the numbers of executions and imprisonments had been vastly inflated in the 1970s, I, I began to see that there was a real problem here with the narrative that we had been working with for, for 30 years, 35 years, and with the reality of the man. I, in terms of being sympathetic towards the Shah, I developed real sympathy for him in his last year especially. I think that that is... Uh, an epic tragedy, what happened in 1978. And I sort of defy anyone to look at his story and not have some sympathy with a man who is dying and is slowly losing everything he's spent his entire life working towards. I mean, it is a, it really is something out of the, the Persian Book of Kings. Let me pick up on some of those points one at a time, uh, the, the, his personality, the shyness, and, and the human rights situation. Um, First, you, you quote the Shah quite prominently, I think you quote him twice in the book, saying, ingratitude is the prerogative of the people. Why did that particular comment stick out for you? He was basically saying, I think, that um, it's the people's right 
to decide whether they want me in the country or not. I'm not going to stay in Iran if, if they don't want me. And I know that many Iranians who live outside Iran blame him for walking away. They say, well, he, he left us. He essentially, when he walked out the door, he doomed us to a life in exile, which is not entirely true because actually the Shah was one of the last people to leave the ship in 1979, January 79. It had already collapsed. Um, he stayed on until he was trying, because he was trying to form a, a provisional government. But I think that he, it's an interesting comment because he was, he was saying that the people ultimately will be the ones who judge what happens to me. And it's their right. They, they can be ungrateful. There is, a, there is a hint of arrogance there, though, isn't there, where he's talking about the people being ungrateful for what he's done to them. In my research and interviews, I, uh, it did come across that he was, he was very, I think, bitterly disappointed in the turn that the Iranian middle class in particular took in the late 1970s. Um, and he felt that, th that they would live to regret this. And there is a wonderful quote in the book where he says at some point, uh, one of his courtiers comes into his, into the, his office in yes. late 1978 and says, Your Majesty, they're tearing your statues down. And he said, he says, I'm not worried because one day they will put my statues up again. So he, had, he took the long view of history as well, which I also took, found very interesting. Uh, you, you say in the book, um, it is an interesting quotation, they'll put my statues back up again, especially in the context of what's happening around the world. We, we see statues yes. be put up and we exactly. see statues taken down. So uh, he, he wasn't wrong that things can change. You, you say... Though today he is remembered as a brutal, I'm quoting you, as a brutal dictator forced mm. from power by brave people, this one-dimensional narrative is an airbrush of the historical record. One, of the, one, one reason Andrew regularly cited for the fall of the Shah was his authoritarian rule. And yet, while he was quick in his final years to rebuff charges of, say, mass murder or the squandering, if not stealing, of Iranian people's money, he did not necessarily deny an authoritarian tendency. You actually quote him saying, listen, to carry through reforms, one can't help but be authoritarian. What, what do you make of that? To run an authoritarian regime, I think you need to have an authoritarian personality and tendencies, and that wasn't who he was. And in some ways, that's maybe one of the fatal underlying flaws of the entire regime. The Shah was not like General Pinochet in Chile. He was not like a Saddam Hussein. He was actually a very, uh, from all accounts, uh, he was quite a soft, gentle man. He was extremely polite. He was very kind and respectful to everyone who worked for him. So, but he also believed that, especially, I think, after the turmoil of the 1940s and 50s, that Iran needed a period of calm and quiet in order to have, so that reforms could be put in for the future. My understanding is that period of ex what I would call uh, executive rule from the throne was only uh, intended to be temporary. He did not intend, and he knew he could not possibly hand over uh, the throne in to his son as he had ruled he he understood that Reza could not be that authoritarian king that he had been in his last 15 years and he talked on many occasions about eventually abdicating and certainly that was the feeling within the family that at some point he would there would be a handover in the early 1980s of course, he's caught out by the cancer diagnosis, which is another great tragedy in the story. And he, towards the end, is while he is struggling with the cancer diagnosis, he is also struggling with um, an economy in Iran that has turned against him because oil revenues were falling. And he was having trouble with his allies in the West. And there was the revival of Islam and a, rev and a resumption of Cold War tensions in the region. So at the exact time when he had decided to liberalize, Iran is hit from several different sides. Uh, it's like trying to open up, uh, democratize in the middle of a storm. It, it actually is not really possible to do that. And I, I think that he, he fell, he came to grief while he was trying to do that.
so I'm going to make liberal reforms, but I have to be an authoritarian to make sure that they they happen? Well, no, he actually had planned to step down. He was trying to transition to back to uh, what he believed was democracy. But he was what happened in 77. Uh, the liberalization began in 1976. It was publicly announced and the restrictions on on censorship on freedom of assembly were gradually relaxed he felt the first year went quite well and so in the summer of 77 he moved into the second phase of liberalization which allowed opposition groups like the national front to start organizing again and people began having peaceful protests now uh the Khomeini people uh saw this as their opening and they began baiting and goading the security forces uh, quite successfully. And you see, as I document in the book, these events in late 1977, where you have these, uh, what I describe in the book as cells of revolutionaries who take advantage of liberalization to try and stir public panic and discord. And they were very successful in doing that. But yes, I mean, the, you, you make a very interesting point. Is it possible for the head of an authoritarian regime to dismantle that regime peacefully and then have a handover to his chosen successor. That's the paradox. And Andrew, I'm That's not sure, maybe, I, maybe I'm misreading it, but I thought when he's talking about when, that, that quote to carry through reforms, I mean, look, he's been the Shah at this point by 79, by 78, for, for, for almost 40 years. Uh, mm. And so, uh, albeit the last 20 years really in, you know, I mean, he started, he was in his 20s. He didn't, uh, you, could, you could sort of say, okay, let's take it from the mid 50s afterwards. But the reforms he was carrying through, you could date back to the 60s, right? So he's had the opportunity to be an authoritarian or to not be an authoritarian, if you will. Mm. Um, and I thought that's what he was referring to that entire period, not just the late 70s. Well, the, the reforms from the, the, the white revolution reforms from, from 63 onwards were social and economic in nature, predominantly social and economic. The political reforms were, were deliberately left out of that because the thinking at that time, and by the way, this is not just the Shah, this, this was the thinking of intellectuals in the West and indeed some in Iran, is that if you instituted far-reaching social and economic reforms while you were instituting political reforms, you could create a revolutionary situation in your country. I know that sounds ironic, but that was the general thinking at the time, especially coming out of the United States. Um, the Shah believed that. He sold the Kennedy administration on that in 63. And they, they basically said to him, okay, we're going to take the pressure off you to on the political side. Show us what you can do in economics and the social side. And he was doing very well until, uh, as I documented in my first book, the, the oil shock really was a shock to the Iranian economy and to the Iranian society right. and had many negative in consequences. And I think that by 76, after he had tried the experiment with the Rastakis party in 75, which was a total disaster, um, by early 76, he understands that he needs to start transitioning. He, the transition is driven by the fact that he knows he has cancer. In a way, he's a victim of his success. It's not possible really for an authoritarian or executive monarch to run a very complicated petro power that has the fifth largest standing army in the world. He needs to bring in experts on the political side so you have that side of it and you also have the Shah's instinctive distrust of democracy because he had lived through the late 40s and early 50s period with Mossadegh. And so he was always on the alert, on the lookout for a strong political personality who might challenge him or challenge the dynasty. Hmm. I would also say that that was not just uh, something that relevant only to the Shah. Uh, all the monarchies in the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean at that time, whether it was um, Greece or Jordan, uh, were struggling with the exact same questions that he was. So he was trying to pull off something that I think was extremely difficult to do. And um, we know that he, perhaps because he did not have full belief 
in that democratic transition that he was very suspicious of what he was doing, he lost control of events. And that's the story of late 77, early 78. He lost control of the story. There are so many interesting paradoxes or contradictions at work. And we had um, Professor Mansur Farhang on the program, um, who, of course, was intimately involved <laughs> by 1979 in, in events in Iran. But, uh, you know, when I made the case to him, uh, and, and he started as a kid, very pro-Mossadegh and all that, that's part of his history, uh, jailed for it, in fact. But but when I said, but wasn't the Shah responsible for a great liberalization uh, through the, say, 60s and 70s? He said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing him probably badly, but he said something like, well, it's a great thing to give women the vote, but what does it mean if there's no democratic election? Uh, so there are these contradictions at work, right, in terms of yes. the reforms. Yes, and, and that that uh, contradiction you pointed out was something that reflective of, of uh, a number of countries in West and East Asia at the same time. And you can point to South Korea, where there was a belief that the fastest way to to develop a country in the developing world, the fastest way to get the economy moving and to get money into people's hands, was to put democracy on ice for a certain number of years. It's always easier for uh, to gather power as the leader to to gather power than it is to disperse it, to give it up when when you understand or you can see there's a problem developing. And that was also one of the problems the Shah was faced with, is how do you slowly give power away when you have concentrated it in your hands? The entire system is dependent on you having that power. And when you've encouraged people in the political system to really distrust each other, he had removed so many r rivals. He had exiled uh, people or he'd given them jobs, nice jobs and sinecures. And so when he was in need of political talent near the end, people either wouldn't work with him or they distrusted him or they just were not involved in politics anymore. Mm. So there was a vacuum and we know what happened in the vacuum. We know who stepped into that vacuum. Let me come to that. I, I want to stick for a second with, uh, I, I said I'd come back to two points, uh, the shyness that you talk about and the human rights abuses, uh, or the, the lesser of the human rights abuses than we expected to find. In terms of his personality, Andrew, you explore a man uh, very different, as you say, from an arrogant authoritarian or a, a Machiavellian dictator. You make the case mm. that he was remarkably shy and modest. I mean, he was relatively diminutive. He was 5'8", uh, didn't personally care that much about fashion or style or even material goods, you say. Didn't even want all those pictures of himself in the palaces, uh, you say. Uh, there's a scene, and all of this is quite sad. There's a scene at the White House in 1977, you describe, where the Shah uh, is being feted with, with uh, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter are there, and, and I think Sarah Vaughan and Dizzy Gillespie are playing on stage. He doesn't get up at the end to shake the, get up on stage and shake their hands. And this is widely interpreted in the press the next day. The nar narrative is he's arrogant and doesn't want to shake the hands of, of black musicians. And you say mm. he was actually sitting there because he was paralyzed by shyness. Um, can you speak to yes. that? <laughs> it's another one of these uh, uh, remarkable contradictions with the Shah is that here you have the, the emperor of Iran who has lived a public life his entire life and he has had to speak in public, he he suffered from anxiety. I mean, this is someone who was taking a Valium every night to sleep and had been since the 1950s. He was someone who had um, intestinal dietary problems, probably related to, to intense the intense levels of stress he was under. He was rigidly in control of himself all the time. And I think that in a situation where at the White House where he was the Shabanu got up very quickly. She, the president and Mrs. Carter, as as you described, they they asked that the Iranian royal couple come up onto the stage and shake hands with the band. But the Shah, in some ways, was very comfortable with the court protocol that removed him from having contact with people because he was a shy fellow. Even with his own family members, he was very shy. They tell me, he found it difficult to express himself. And it is a really sad episode. I, I was. I, I thought that that was uh, sort of a classic case of how you have a baked-in narrative of of this 
you know, awful, you know, he's rude, he's arrogant, he's racist. And the fact is that he is just very misunderstood. Um, and I'm not sure that the Americans ever understood the Shah. And in fact, um, which is remarkable when you think of the amount of money and resources they invested in Iran while he was in power and the way they depended on him. And yet, if you read the CIA intelligence analyses of him, they could be talking about someone else completely different. It's not clear to me that they are they're talking about the Shah, but are they really talking about the Shah as the man? And I guess I would just raise another point about this, is that they had no concept of the Shah's total and absolute commitment to the Persian kingship and the Far, which is something I talk about in the book. Not once in any of the thousands of documents I've read have they ever, did the Americans ever understand or that they were even aware of the fact that, that their ally had a very traditional view of Persian kingship. And, and that's a very important thing to consider, I think. I think it's worth stopping for a moment and, and saying, I just I said that anything you're going to say, you know, there's going to be naysayers, there's going to be people on either side of this. I can mm. hear a naysayer saying, or 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 how would you respond to a naysayer mm. saying, really? Well, how shy and modest can someone be if they're presiding over a police state in Savak? So how do we yeah. how do we make connect those two dots? Well, the Shah was also, I think, actually related to shyness and being retired is that retire having a retiring nature is that he did not like to hear bad news. He was someone who, what, there was an element of, of self-denial there. And start, the, the human rights issue that we're talking about is really focused on the period 1971 to 76, which is, I, in, the, in the book I refer it to as, as, as the Iranian, as a dirty war against leftist, leftist subversion. That's when human rights in, in Iran became an international scandal. The security uh, officials who worked with the Shah, who knew him well, including General Nasseri, regarded him as so soft that they really created this internal police state that, of course, he was aware that Savak was active and they were suppressing leftists, but they kept the full details of that away from him. I mean, his wife went to him repeatedly saying, you know, this person has been locked up, this artist, this poet, this writer, this is outrageous. But he didn't. Uh, he was not aware of what was happening in the prisons with the torture. I mean, I think that's quite clear to me that that was the case, because when he was informed, starting in early '76, he was the one who invited the International Committee of the Red Cross and um, Amnesty International and the International Commission of Jurists into Iran to conduct independent investigations. When they came back to him and they said, we have all the numbers of people who are arrested in the prisons and you really need to focus on this. He did focus on it. And he, uh, starting in early 77, when these the, they, they released their reports, that's when you see him outlaw torture and he turns over the prisons to the ICRC, which ironically... Uh, his enemies, especially in the Islamist movement, saw as a sign of real weakness. But it's even more than that, as you do in your book. Uh, you are a former researcher at uh, Human Rights Watch. I mean, you're, mm. you're hardly, your, your career would hardly suggest that you're an apologist for human rights abuses. Uh, no. you, you claim in this book that you were astounded to find that while the Shah of Iran was no angel when it came to jailing and executing dissidents, as you just talked about, the number of human rights abuses under the Shah were, you say, dramatically lower than what the popular narrative suggests. What can you tell us about that? The numbers are very important. And for me, uh, because this, uh, what I referred to earlier as a baked in narrative, as a, as a, a brutal dictator, the bloody dictator, a bit like Nicholas, Nicholas II of Russia, who was accused of being Nicholas the bloody. And now we know that he was a very soft retiring autocrat himself, um, or like Louis XVI of France. But that these numbers are important because they have been used for the for a long time to justify the caricature of the Shah as uh, this, this sort of criminal as a as a brutal dictator we can't really have an honest full discussion of the period and the man without having the numbers 
And now we have the numbers, ironically, courtesy of the Islamic Republic, which did this study um, probably about 20 years ago now. Uh, they decided to memorialize all the victims of the Pahlavi, Pahlavi regime. Khomeini, remember, had had accused the Shah of, of complicity in the murders of 60 to 70,000 people um, and 100,000 people in lockup in prisons. Right. Those numbers had been repeated by Amnesty International in the mid-1970s. When you look at the numbers we have now, which, by the way, are confirmed by the ICRC, those numbers now have gone down from 100,000 people in prison to, uh, in 1976, 75, 76, it was about 3,200. And from 60 to 70,000 executions, we're down to um, 383 people died in the Shah's prisons. Uh, through combination of torture or suicide or execution. Those numbers are important because although there were, there were human rights abuses, I, I'm not saying that, and it's, a, it's something I feel very sensitive about because of my background. For historians, it's very important because we need to know what the numbers were so we can have an honest revision of the entire period. I am particularly interested in numbers because in the late 1990s, when I was at the UN and Human Rights Watch, I was the person who worked on the international campaign for landmines, which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in yes. 1997. We had numbers for the uh, landmines that were infesting more than 60 countries around the world at the end of the Cold War. We had numbers provided by governments. We had numbers provided by NGOs by communities on the ground. And my job was to study those numbers and see, you know, try and reconcile them. So once you reconcile the numbers, you can start to do serious investigative uh, work. So I was very shocked. And in some ways, when the numbers came down, I remember thinking this was in early 2013, and I had just started writing the book. And I thought, oh, my God, this is a real, in some ways, it's a real problem for me, because if the numbers go down that dramatically for Iran, what does that say about the Shah? I mean, that raises a whole series of questions about who he was and how did the numbers get into circulation? And as I document in the book, I actually uh, traced foreign correspondents in the West who were responsible for putting those numbers in the Guardian newspaper yes. and the Los Angeles Times, for example, and I interviewed them and I said, how did you get the numbers and why did you, what was your fact checking uh, for those numbers? And there was no fact checking. The numbers came from Mr. Gospode, Mr. Yazdi and Mr. Bani Saad. What did Bani Saad say when you talked to him about that? We had a really fascinating three hour <laughs> discussion. He, initially, he was very, I think, very bored with me for about two hours. And then I asked him a question where he suddenly became very alert. Well, for them, they were revolutionaries the means justify the ends they you know they weren't interested in in the correct numbers what they were interested in doing was creating the perception in the west that the shah was a monster and that he was a terrible guy and that they would do a better job of running iran than than he would and the shah made a real mistake when he thought and he said I can't believe anyone would believe this nonsense. This is rubbish. And I'm not going to dig dignify it with the response. These numbers are so crazy. You know, the idea that you could have 100,000 people locked up in Iran at that time was ridiculous because the prison capacity was just not there. And if there were 100,000 people taken off the streets, where were the families who were, who were missing their relatives? So the foreign correspondents were very sympathetic to the revolutionaries. Uh, this was the early 70s, remember, when in the Middle East there were all sorts of rebel and revolutionary movements that had sort of or, an aura of romanticism about it. So they repeated these numbers. Um, and one of the reporters told me that this uh, Mr. Gotspade would come by the bureau in Beirut where he lived at that time. And he would say, uh, look, Jonathan, can you, I, I've got a story for you. I, I, can you just run it for me? And Jonathan would put it in the Washington Post. And I said to him, I don't understand how you can do that. How are you, you're just repeating what Gotspade is giving to you. And he said, Andrew, all I can say is that 
it was the period of the times. He said these were revolutionary movements, and there was a general sympathy, there was antipathy towards the Shah. But Andrew, the the, um, the, the narrative wasn't just written by the revolutionaries. I mean, it's created the narrative around the Shah uh, for the, for the years after the revolution uh, has been created from all corners, including the Americans and the British. Uh, you know, both British Ambassador Parsons and Ambassador mm. American Ambassador Sullivan, uh, who were there at the time, uh, have written these autobiographies and painted a very negative picture of Mohammad Reza Shah. Pretty much depicting him as a this demoralized, indecisive, you know, weak character mm. clinging to their sleeves like a, a lost child in, in his final days in Iran. What do you make of those characterizations? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing like a loser in history. I mean, after, you know, after the revolution, everyone heaped every sort of opprobrium on the Shah because he had lost. And Parsons and Sullivan both had reasons for not talking about certain aspects of their role as uh, what they were doing in the late 70s. I mean, Parsons was frankly, he missed the entire revolution. Uh, He missed the biggest story in modern Iranian history. And Mr. Sullivan, nowhere in his autobiography, which is a very uh, thinly written, if anyone's read it, it's a very interesting thinly written document, uh, he doesn't talk about his secret opening to Mr. Bazargan in the spring of 1978, or indeed to his desire, his his recommendation to Washington in late 78 that that Khomeini would make a really great head of state because he would be he would be like Mahatma Gandhi, and he could he could keep the army in line, and we would have an an anti-communist Iran, um, and the Shah was finished. And Bazargan would be the prime minister. I mean, that was that was really the idea that they had. I interviewed his underlings in the embassy. There were three of them who were still alive at that stage. Unfortunately, the, the charge has died. And he was he was very honest with me. Charlie Ness, a wonderful guy who felt it had been a complete disaster. The other two um, were very defensive of Sullivan and of the strategy that they had of 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 but and then they wouldn't they wouldn't accept that they had made a mistake although they seem to they seem to understand that they had during in the course of my interviews with them there's ample evidence that has surfaced in recent years definitively proving high levels of coordination between Khomeini's most inner circles and the Americans uh, prior to the revolution uh, I've heard this theory. You tell me. It, it, I mean, is it conceivable that the that the whole occupation of the U.S. embassy in Tehran uh, could have been a cover up operation? What do you make of the the people who say that? You know, I I have not studied the embassy takeover. There's a lot we don't still don't know from that period. There's a lot we're still finding out, and that's why this is such a rich area for ex, of exploration. It requires really solid investigative research. Uh, for example, one of the things that I found out that was I thought was very interesting was that the CIA was tapping the Charbonneau's telephone line in the palace in late 78. I found out that the head of French intelligence and the French embassy in Tehran knew that the Shah had cancer. These things weren't known even 10 years ago. But when we find information like that out, it helps us better understand the motives of the Western powers as well as they watched the Shah flailing in late 1978 and wondered why he was not ordering the crackdown that they believed could have saved the regime. That's a great segue because where I wanted to go, I want to zoom out and look about look at where we are 40 years hence and 40 years after the death of the Shah. Um, First, let's talk about the revolution. You, you've said, you say in the book that researching the Iranian revolution, I'm quoting you, is like entering a dark tunnel without a flashlight. Well, we know that there were massive amounts of people in the streets wanting change and then welcoming mm. the arrival of Khomeini. And then we also know that most of those people who prosecuted the revolution alongside Khomeini and were not part of the Islamic formalists pivoting towards theocratic rule were either killed or forced to leave the country. And we know that subsequently the current regime has proceeded with a level of authoritarianism that makes the Shah's era pale in comparison. So mm. why is it such a dark tunnel? And why, from your perspective, is there so much disagreement in the diaspora? Because controlling the historical narrative is critical to the survival of the Islamic Republic. In fact, the Islamic Republic has made the narrative of the revolution the justification for it for its existence. 
And so there's a, a, a fight going on <laughs> at the moment over control, who gets, con- gets to control the narrative. It's, it's very interesting to me that Oil Kings was translated inside Iran and published inside Iran because the regime thought that the book revealed the Shah to be to have made serious prob- uh, miscalculations towards the Saudi- Saudis in the late 1970s. And they were trying to score points against the Saudis, and they were trying to use this as a nationalist argument against Saudi Arabia at home. But with Fall of Heaven, when the book came out, there was a, just a torrent of abuse that was directed at me. And in fact, the regime created 12 websites offering three free translations of the book to Iranians. And if you clicked on the website to get your free download, the Iranian intelligence services gained control of your computer. They, they essentially sucked all the information out because they want to know who's interested in the Shah. If you're interested in the Shah, that suggests that you might have counter-revolutionary subversive tendencies. It's like, for example, um, every so often there's a rumor that goes around that, that the Shah Banu has died. And she's well aware of this because she has people who phone her and say, Your Majesty, I'm so worried. I thought you know, I'd heard that you had passed away. And she, you know, she laughs about this. But the, the reason they, that the regime is behind these rumors is that they want to see the reaction on the streets of Tehran. They want to know that if she, it, when she dies, they want to know who's going to come out into the streets to mourn her or to stage a protest for the monarchy. So this is a game of shadows that's going on. Some of it's public and a lot of it's not. And um, for those of us who dip our toe into the waters, you know, there are piranhas in the water and it, it's very, um, it requires a bit of a thick skin, I think, to delve into the revolution. It, and I will just say this as well. The study, st- this writing about the revolution, I found was a very, very dark, depressing topic as, as a historian. It was a very sad topic. Most of my interviewees wept during our encounters and and i'm including the americans in that too american nationals who were in tehran during the revolution it is clear that if you lived through the revolution you were traumatized and i'm sure that many of your listeners who are younger will have experience with parents or grandparents who lived through the revolution and probably carried that trauma with them still today yes so it is a very dark subject because of the outcome it wasn't like the french revolution where you could ex- you could say well there were these themes of egalite fraternite liberté etc um the iranian revolution is a tunnel that keeps getting darker and darker and um you know we're still in that tunnel today i think when you talk about the uh andrew the torrents of abuse you said that you received when this book came out from whom Oh, there's a wave of trolls, an army of trolls that that um, came after me. Uh, the book had been released on a Tuesday. There was a an uh, book review in the New York Times book review on Friday. I think it was posted on a, the Friday night, and the reviewer accused me of being anti-Islamist, which I thought was quite a strange thing to say. But I knew what that person was. That person was actually this was like red meat. Uh, I knew what she was doing. She was she was um, essentially uh, putting me out there in the public square to be torn apart, and that's what happened. In fact, um, uh, the the abuse and the threats were so great that on the Monday, Amazon, which now unfortunately has to have a standing committee of of people who meet every day to consider threats and violence and abuse against authors online, they met. And they had to go through my Amazon page and um, clean it up because the 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 trolls were the abuse was just so awful. And I closed down all my social media accounts. Um, it was dangerous at that time. This was in summer of two in twenty sixteen. To be accused of that was when the book is not really a, it's not about that at all. I found very unsettling and disturbing at the time. Historians are very much on the front line of the culture wars that are going on now. And so you would think that because we're in the academy, we are somewhat elevated or removed from what's going on. Actually, 
historians are coming under sustained and severe attack from authoritarian regimes and their supporters. Uh, and it gets very personal and it's, um, it's very unpleasant. You know, your book itself seems to be evidence of a shifting popular narrative about the Shah of Iran and how he is seen as a historical figure. So uh, the question is, as we're well into this interview, how do you believe he and his years as the ruler of Iran are seen uh, differently from, say, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago? I think it's safe now to talk about his accomplishments. It's not always about Savak. It's not always about the human rights side. We can now look at the human rights side and you can look at education, literacy, health care, the environment, all of the, the legislative achievements that he that he put in place. You can look at the infrastructure he put into Iran. You can really have, an, for the first time now, we're far enough away from the revolution to have a really honest, sober discussion of who this man was and what he was trying to achieve. And, and that's what the study of history is all about. I love what I do because it's investigative work and it, it, it is very, um, it's rewarding for me to have Iran, young Iranians or Iranians of all ages, actually, who will write to me and say, I read your book and I learned a lot. And this is not what I thought happened. And, and they thank me. And that's, that's really wonderful. I love hearing those. I always write back to people. I make my books accessible. I don't want to write just for the academy. I want to write for anyone who's interested in, in a good story, good historical story. And everything that I do is very carefully documented and backed up. I think Fall of Heaven has 2,200 footnotes. But could you have written this book in 1990? Uh, could you have written, even written this book in 2000? No, no, it's not. It wasn't, it wasn't possible. No, it, it, it actually, this book was made possible by the Oil Kings, my first book. That book was read by a number of Iranians on, on different sides of the political spectrum. And there was a general consensus that whoever this person is, he's doing something different. And, and I will talk to him if he, if he approaches me. But vis-a-vis -vis the um, feelings about the Shah in the diaspora, yes. um, yeah. when you say you're allowed to, to talk about his accomplishments now, um, when did that change? Since when has that become okay? I would say the last... 10 years it's now becoming and and there's a lot of i think there's going to be a lot of scholarship on the social programs on what went right it's okay to say that you know we know that things went wrong of course they went wrong there was a revolution but we can also now say a lot of things actually went right and we know that because those programs that he that he and also the charbonneau instituted in iran many of them actually survived to this day. They were not demolished by the Khomeini people when they came in. They just changed the names. They purged the people who ran the programs and they gave them, put them in a different direction, but they kept them in more or less intact because those programs were working really well. He was the great builder of modern Iran. And, and if you, if you avoid talking about him, you're not talking about the modern history of Iran. You can't get around this guy. I found it fascinating that Iranians are completely captivated by the Shah. And when I ask them, why aren't you interested in Khomeini? I mean, I never hear this level of interest in Ayatollah Khomeini. They just, their eyes glaze over. They have no interest at all in talking about the Ayatollah. But which Iranians are you asking? Um, even inside inside Iran, there was no interest in Khomeini. In fact, uh, I, I went when I was in Qom. I, I, the people I were, the, the religious people who hosted me, who were very kind, they took me up to Tehran to Khomeini's house in the northern suburbs, and, and um, there was a smattering of people there. And it was a hot day, and I thought, well, it's the weather. But then they took me to Niavar. I insisted on going to Niavaran, actually, Sadabad, I should say, and then Niavaran. And in Sadabad, there was lines of people outside the gate. There were there were hundreds of people walking around the grounds, and my guide was embarrassed and uncomfortable because he could see that people did not want to go to Khomeini's house; they wanted to go to see the Shah's house. They were interested in the Pahlavis. Interesting. And that struck me as 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 a a, a very interesting um, 
how, how Iranians are, what the, the interest of the Iranian people right now is in that history before the revolution. Andrew Scott Cooper, I thank you so much for the, the time you've given us today. Th thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Dr. Andrew Scott Cooper, an historian, analyst, and the author of two books on the history of the modern Middle East, including The Fall of Heaven, The Pahlavis, and The Final Days of Imperial Iran. Dr. Cooper joined us from Brussels, Belgium. This is full time for the Rook Media series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 31. Please check out our regular editions of Rook and all things related at our website, rookmedia.com. That is where you can find previous episodes, guests, funnies, videos, etc. Rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who make Rook Media happen. Talented Anahita Super Parisa, Smart Pega, Ponta the Artist, Savvy Roham, Ahai Mertad, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi and Mizumbashin.